reminds me of other times when we've been together when motions have moved me also. Uh, our last speaker this morning before we do the, the panel is Catherine Short. Catherine graduated from the Thomas Aquinas College in 1980 with a BA in liberal arts. Uh, she was so excited she moved on and finished her law degree from Bold Hall at UC Berkeley in 1983. In 85, Katie began sidewalk counseling outside an abortion clinic. And over the next few years, her efforts turned to using her legal training to protect the rights of other pro-life activists, including rescuers, sidewalk counselors, and crisis pregnancy centers. In 1989, she participated in establishing the Life Legal Defense Foundation. She now serves as the legal director for the foundation. In her years with the LLDF, Katie has written numerous briefs for state and federal courts, including petitions for uh, and a Mickey brief for the United States Supreme Court and the California Street Supreme Court. She has also co-authored the text of Proposition 73, 85, uh, Proposition 4, and most recently our new uh, parental notification initiative, which is circulating for, for signatures. So if you haven't signed and you're from California, uh, please do. Uh, she, uh, she has uh, been a, a stalwart campaigner in this and is now involved in the leadership of the, the current uh, parental notification uh, issue. Uh, she was recently co-counsel on the People's Advocate versus ICOC as I mentioned with Dana uh, that challenged the constitutionality of the governing board of the, uh, the CERM, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Um, just sort of a parenthesis here. Uh, there's actually movement in California now. They want to reauthorize that, uh, that issue again here. Uh, so we're going to be back to whether or not the people of California want to spend another six billion dollars on this boondoggle. Uh, not to mention an immoral boondoggle. Um, and thanks to, uh, to Katie and Dana for their hard work on that. Uh, Katie, Katie's primary focus is defending the free speech rights of pro-life activists at every level of both the state and the federal court. She's married to fellow TAC graduate Bill Short. Uh, they have nine children and it's always good to hear from a mother.
uh, you know, with the trend is the way it's going, it would be difficult to become a teacher, a lawyer, a judge, uh, you know, a doctor, unless without paying at least some lip service to that agenda. Um, there's also just judicial action, uh, creation of new causes of action against doctors or nurses for failing to do something that post hoc somebody says they should have done. Um, now, the agenda seems to be, if we're going after individuals, sort of go after the low-hanging fruit, which are tend to be nurses, and at this point nurses and pharmacists. Nurses, I think, because they're more involved simply in assisting, or you know, nobody can say that you had to do an abortion well, as this example was given. You just had to pick up the pieces afterwards. And so they're, again, they're the, the low-hanging fruit there, the ones that are trying to pick off in this are nurses and pharmacists. And um, in the pharmacists, for this reason, are sort of a few years ahead of the game. You can look and see what's happening to them to see where the rest is going. And uh, we had, there have been two cases of note recently, one in Illinois and one in Washington State. Um, and since Washington State sort of covered everything, I'll discuss that case. Because they had a, a regulatory uh, rule that required uh, pharmacists to dispense all contraceptives of whatever nature to anyone who asked for them. There was no provision for any sort of conscious or religious view of exception. And this was challenged, and interesting, but the first, it was challenged on a few grounds, and the first ground that the judge discussed was, he said this is a whole new question, a novel question, which is, is there a fundamental right to refuse to participate in the taking of a human life? Because this is something nobody's ever had to confront before. There was never a question that someone could be forced to take a human life. And um, the doctor, he, I mean, excuse me, the judge discussed this at some length about the precedence for finding a fundamental right, ultimately came down and said, it's not my job to declare a new right. He said, he said in effect, you know where I would rule on this, but I'm going to have to leave this to the Supreme Court. And then he moved on to the religious freedom uh, issues. And um, just, it, it's a good, it, his decision is a good uh, primer in religious freedom uh, 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 jurisprudence because he laid out the, the relevant standard. The standard for finding a First Amendment violation of religious freedom is whether the, well, the question is the, the, the way of law or rule or government action would be evaluated is, is the law neutral and generally applicable? And does, it, and does it have just simply an incidental impact on religious practice rather than a deliberate impact on religious practice? In other words, is it targeting religion or is it incidental? And is this law neutral and generally applicable? And um, the, the court, the judge, looked at, at how the Washington mandate came about and how it was being applied, and he said, no, this is not neutral. If her, it, it's not neutral. There are so many exceptions. Basically, a pharmacy or a pharmacist could get an exception for any number of secular reasons. We don't want to carry that drug because it's too expensive. It's difficult to store. It's um, a, a magnet for crime. It just doesn't fit in our way. We're doing geriatrics here. We don't need pediatrics. There, you know, if, you, if there was any other way, they, they accepted basically any secular reason, but they would not accept the really reason of this violates my conscience. And the court said, no, this is the business. You, your interest, whatever your interest is, is not so great that it should not permit uh, a religious freedom exception because you're obviously allowing all these other exceptions. And actually, that, that reminds me in terms of that the state's interested. You know, the states, they always propound these very serious on the interest to protect access to all contraceptive drugs, blah, blah, blah. But their reaction to, uh, uh, no, they won't say contraceptive, is we, we want to, uh, you know, protect access so everybody has access to all, you know, legally available drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but when it came down to it, and if you don't want to comply, shut down your pharmacy. So where was the concern with access there? You know, the the, the answer to that was, oh, you go ahead, shut down the pharmacy. Better with that than you not provide this one drug or this one class of drugs. Um, and so the the court noted the many many exemptions. And the fact that basically any exemption for a secular reason, the court also noted that the leg in the legislative history, it was extremely clear that this was targeted at those you know people with religious convictions. In fact, the court even noticed that when the rule was promulgated, um, 
it, two pharmacists this must supply any drug. The file name on the computer was, you know, basically letter, 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 plan B, letter, letter, letter. <laughs> it was clear that it was just about plan B and just about forcing um, pharmacists with religious convictions um, to, to prescribe or to mm -hmm. provide plan B. Um, so the court found it was, it was yeah, a, a violation of the First Amendment for that reason as well, because it was clearly targeted at religion, not just had an incidental effect on, on, on free exercise. And I'd just like to, to read the, the last um, uh, the summation of the course, and, because there's one interesting part in here. See if you catch it. So the rules are not at all narrowly tailored. They are instead riddled with sexual exemptions that undermine their stated goal of increasing patient access to all medications. The rules operate primarily to force religious objectors to dispense Plan B while preventing other pharmacies to refrain from dispensing other medications for virtually any reason. They permit, Catholic, they permit Catholic pharmacies to ignore the rules altogether. Nor has the state demonstrated or argued that it has a compelling interest in reaching its result. The rules cannot survive strict scrutiny. Did you catch that? They exempted all Catholic pharmacies. When I read that, I went back over and over again. This is, I think, the state that the situation uh, that Bill Cox was talking about, where it used to be the way, <laughs> When the, when the Catholic Church stepped forward and said, you know, we don't, you know, this, this does not work for us, that would be the end of the discussion. Apparently, in Washington State, it still was. And this, this was, so this was not even about Catholic pharmacies. This was about just the few holdouts there who were not with Catholic institutions, and, and yet they promulgated this whole rule just to rope those people in while exempting Catholic pharmacies. So I almost hated to get into that because it's kind of a distraction, but I thought it was so odd. <laughs> um, uh, another, another threat, I think, comes on, on a sort of a more global level, is from our perception of the role of physicians. And um, that perception translates into how we speak about them, and then how we think about them, and ultimately how we <coughs> deal with them in public policy. And there, there was a time when it was considered Dr. Who best. And I think this is best illustrated in, of all things, Roe versus Wade. Um, that decision, everybody thinks, well, Roe versus Wade, that just said a woman, woman has a right to abortion. It said that, but it said that in one place, in a way that was almost, almost dicta. And I'd like to read you a series of quotes, and watch, watch how the role of the woman diminishes and the role of the fish, physician increases. The first quote is, the right of privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Second, all these are factors the woman and her responsible physician necessarily will consider in consultation. Doctor moves in the picture. Neither interests justify broad limitations on the reasons for which a physician and his pregnant patient might decide that she should have an abortion in the early stages of pregnancy. Now the doctor's first. This means, on the other hand, that for the period of pregnancy prior to this compelling point, the attending physician, in consultation with his patient, is free to determine without regulation by the state that in his medical judgment, the patient's pregnancy should be terminated. terminated. So now he's front and center, and the patient is in parentheses almost. For the stage prior to approximately the end of the first trimester, the abortion decision and its effectuation must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. So now she's not even being consulted. <laughs> Finally, the, the grand peroration summary. The decision vindicates the right of the physician to administer medical treatment according to his professional judgment, up to the point where important state interests provide compelling justifications for intervention. Up to those points, the abortion decision in all its aspects is inherently and primarily a medical decision, and basic responsibility for it must rest with the physician. If an individual practitioner abuses the privileges of exercising proper medical judgment, the usual remedies, judicial and professional, are available. So at the very end, it is, it's the doctor who gets to decide. Well, you know, it's his decision, and yet now we're at the point where the doctor is simply supposed to be a service provider. Woman walks in, whatever you want. You know, he, he, he doesn't exercise, now he, he's not supposed to exercise medical judgment. He's simply supposed to provide a service to a consumer. And I think that, that sort of language has diminished the role of doctors. They are no longer uh, 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 professionals, they are providers. And their clients, uh, their patients, are consumers, and what they're providing are services rather than care. 
And it's interesting, the, uh, this almost, the same reasoning was used almost to legalize assisted suicide back in 1996. The case came before the uh, Ninth Circuit, a challenge to Washington State's ban on assisted suicide. And the Ninth Circuit, uh, following that idea of doctor knows best, said, you know, we, we, you know, there's no worry that this will be in any way abused. Um, we, we believe that physicians would not assist the patient in his life if there were any significant doubt about the patient's true wishes. To do so would be contrary to the physician's fundamental training, their conservative nature, and the ethics of their profession. In any case, since doctors are highly regulated, regulated professionals, it should not be difficult for the state or the profession itself to establish rules and procedures that will ensure that the occasional negligent or careless recommendation by a licensed physician will not result in an uninformed or erroneous decision by the patient or his family. Again, we are just going to trust the doctors to do what's right. And um, then, interestingly, the court then invokes the experience with abortion. Since once the court held that a woman has a once the court held that a woman has a constitutional right to have an abortion, doctors began performing abortions routinely, and the ethical integrity of the medical profession remained undiminished. <laughs> so, following the recognition of a constitutional right to assist in suicide, we believe that doctors have engaged in permitted practice when appropriate, and that the integrity of the medical profession would survive without blemish. So. Um, I thought it was very interesting to, of all things, invoke what happened with abortion, where indeed, once, once this, all this discussion about how it's the doctor's decision, the floodgates were opened to just uh, abortion clinics where doctors had no relationship with their patients or anything like that, and that they should invoke, invoke that of all things. Fortunately, that decision was overturned by the United States Supreme Court. So I, I think that we have a challenge there to restore the idea of doctors as as trained professionals that, who have to abide by a, a code of conduct and, and that they are not simply providers. Um, and um, one, one result of this shift in thinking about doctors um, has that they have moved under the ambit, almost without discussion, the ambit of public accommodation laws and discrimination laws. They um, now are governed by what for instance, in California, there's something called the UNRRA Act, which was originally designed to prevent discrimination against people in, in you know, say, public accommodations. A business couldn't discriminate against minorities. That was the original idea of the UNRRA Act. And it's gotten expanded and expanded and expanded to the point now where it applies to doctors. They are considered to be you know, a public accommodation. And in, in a classic case of uh, hard, hard facts making bad law, uh, this started where there was a doctor, med medical group in a small town, and one of their patients um, filed some complaint with the Board of Medical Quality Insurance. And then the doctor said, um, thank you very much. We don't need to see you or your family anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and so they brought a lawsuit alleging one of the cause of action was this public accommodations law. And the court ruled that uh, they could not do that, that they had to provide services. But it was a lot, hemmed in a, a lot by the facts of the case, that there were no other near, nearby services for them to use, and this was a, uh, they were providing something involved the public interest, you know, in providing health care. Well, unfortunately, none of those um, uh, barriers held. So to the point where more recently, there was a case where, uh, called Benita versus North County Women's Group, where a woman, an unmarried woman, went to, to a fertility clinic and she wanted to receive various services, including intrauterine, well, I guess they, they did actually provide a number of services up to the point where she asked for intrauterine insemination. And the doctors who were Christians said, you know, no, we don't do that for unmarried people. And so she sued and the Supreme Court said that, that religious freedom was not a defense to an unwritten act violation. And um, so basically, the doctor's choice was provide service, you, you can provide the service to everyone or no one. And uh, because her marital status, that's one of the things that's expanded under UNRWA, it used to be, again, sort of the idea was uh, uh, race, religion, things like that. It is now expanded to marital status and sexual orientation. So doctors are unable to make any distinctions in the services they provide based on those criteria. And now, I mean, one could say, well, you shouldn't have provided your insemination to anyone. So, you know, that's what their decision was. That's a good decision. But 
I, I had to think about um, reading that book by One More Soul called Physicians Healed, where if you read the stories of a number of these doctors, what they do, many of them, when they were, were sort of moving along the path towards supporting the culture of life, there was a gradual, it was not usually a, a road to Damascus situation. It was more often a cutting off, well, I stopped doing this, and then I stopped doing that, and I moved back to that. And unfortunately, a decision like this, which says it's all or nothing, cuts short that process. And so it either accelerates the process or it derails the process of, of that sort of conversion. Um, so, then uh, a, a final consideration is, in, in I think all that we're talking about today, uh, in terms of you know whether public policy considerations, public policy proposals, or um, you know the Catholic health plan, is uh, what I what I say is consequences have consequences, and what I mean by that is how we decide to penalize or. Um, or on the other hand, encourage activity, um, affects the individuals who are subject to those things. We, we tend to think, or, ordinarily, when we think of the law disapproving of something, we think of a criminal law. Okay, well, it's just become illegal. We criminalize it. And if we, on the, on the other end of the scale, we might subsidize something that we really thought ought to be, ought to be more of. But there's a whole range of public policy options in between those two. And um, there are many ways that something can be discouraged without actually outlining it. And one of the primary ways for those who are doctors and, and, or, and prior, even then in the field of obstetrics is liability. I mean, as every doctor knows, there are legions of parasitical attorneys out there waiting to sweep down <laughs> and take advantage of you know, any human tragedy that comes along. And how the law treats that in terms of the burden of proof uh, the presumptions, the, you know, how, um, or even creating a new cause of action, a cause of action for wrongful birth. You know, that was unheard of 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. The idea that you could get damages for the fact that this child is now alive and he would have been dead had you told me about this test or told me about this, I would have aborted this child. Well, now I have this child, so, you know, now there's huge damages for that. There is no comparable wrongful abortion cause of action. And so we, we refer to this in, in, in an article a few years ago as the tilted playing field. Because the, the, the whole the trend of policy in terms of liability for doctors is tilted towards recommending abortion, whether it's because of a fuel defect, whether it's because of uh, the mother's condition. Everything points towards it's safer or to have an abortion and start over. And so, um, I mean, right, right now, um, I, I have you know, a 20 year history as an obstetrical patient. And during that history, I, I saw what, what, what was going on I, I, from the first to the last. And by the, my last child, I had to sign something saying, I do not want this text. Because that was the only way to protect the doctor in case something was wrong with the child. And, and, and so, I mean, how far are we now then from a presumption? that any child born with a defect, you know, you could, there could be a legal presumption created that if the child is born with a defect uh, that could have been diagnosed prenatally, the woman was not adequately counseled. So, and then the burden of proof would be on the doctor to rebut that. And again, you know, we're here, I, I believe that the reason you're here is you're faithful Catholics. But think of the people who are kind of in between, the doctors who can be pushed more and more by that sort of subtle coercion. Um, so, and finally, I just as a, want to point out that, I mean, we're here to talk, we're talking about religious freedom or rights of conscience, but that's, those are a defense. They're, they're a defense, they're a fortress, but they're not an army going forth. And we, we do need to think in terms of how do we push back against this culture of death? Uh, because it's, it's not enough just to say, okay, well, at least we don't have to do it. We should always be pushing back um, against this culture of death and explaining the reasons. I was very uh, happy to see this, and I recommend this to everyone, uh, in the Catholic Medical Association table, a little open letter that they had there, written by five women physicians, uh, about the dangers of contraception. This is the sort of information that has to get out there. And um, because if we're preserving our Catholic institutions, we have to be preserving them for a reason, you know, for, so that they, not just, not just for their own sake, but that they can continue their mission, which is in bringing
really solve the life of the world. Um, and then, um, finally, I just want to point out, with, with the HHS mandate, we were talking about, uh, I, I see that as a, uh, like a collision between various false ideologies, creating a big train wreck. And one of those false ideologies is the idea that abortion and contraception are, are health care. They're, you know, that's because, and we've gotten into that mindset because they come dressed up with white coats and in, they come in prescription bottles and it looks like medicine. And we really, you know, have to get across the idea these are social decisions that use medical means to implement them. It's not health care. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you.